asked you earlier on about a rhino story and I told you that I would tell it to you on my way home when the night was dark and full of terrors and not full of... <laughs> and not full of terrapins or chameleons or genets or civets or bush babies, etc., etc. And so shall it be that I will tell the story of the rhinoceros. But the story begins not with the rhinoceros, but with two ants. And you may have heard the story before, but I'm going to tell it again. I told it a while back. It begins with two ants called Morris or Maurice and Albert. Maurice and Albert were two ants and they lived in a, well, call them termites actually, they weren't ants at all, that's very insulting of me. They were termites and they lived in a mound. And they were sort of uppity millennial types, you know, dissatisfied with life, slightly entitled. Felt that uh, life hadn't dealt them quite the, quite the hand that they had expected at birth. You know, they promised great things and suddenly they just found themselves working uh, in the production line of termite existence. They weren't particularly favoured, they weren't higher caste uh, termites like the soldiers, and they struggled to accept their lot in life. And one day they were moaning and groaning as they lifted sand granule by sand granule onto the edge of the termite mound and mixed it with a bit of saliva and a bit of dung and uh, were considering their lot not very silently they were whining away at each other and uh, Maurice said to Albert oh, I can't believe this is what we got to do the rest of our days just shoveling dirt and mixing it with our own dung and saliva and bricking it here and Albert said I can't believe it either. I think it's just a fat cheek. I don't think sign up for this, but I didn't get an option to sign up for anything anyway. The conversation is not relevant to the story. What is relevant to the story is that they suddenly heard a thunderous noise and the earth shook around them. And they scuttled up to the top of the termite mound because although they were dissatisfied, entitled millennial types, they were also quite clever. And so they went up to the top of the mound and they looked. And indeed, because they had six legs, they could put two hands to their eyes and look from side to side. And there, coming out of the west as the sun set, was the terrifying figure of Ubejan. And Ubejan was the black rhinoceros. And Ubejan was on his territorial marking, and at that particular time of the year, he liked to mark just past this termite mound. But a tree had fallen over his normal path, and the mound wasn't very big, and so on his way past, he was going, do, 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 do. Ubejan, Ubejan, Ubejan. He squashed the mound, and then he carried on going. And there was a great emergency, of course, within the termite mound, and not being born of great intelligence, most termites, it was decided by the building committee of workers in consultation with the queen, who was far more interested in breeding than she was in building, that she, uh, that they would rebuild the mound in exactly the same place. Now, I mean, this rhinoceros took about four days to do his circle, and so in four days they'd got quite a long way to building the next mound. And on the evening of the fourth day, Albert and Maurice, who had finished their day day's labours, were sitting out. They'd created themselves a little balcony where they could watch the sunset from the, the sort of terrace, if you like, of their mound. And there they were watching the sunset when, once again, the thunderous noise came to their ears. And they looked at each other and Maurice said to Albert, he said, oh, I don't believe it. I think it's coming back this way. And Albert said, I think he's right. I think you're right, Maurice. I think he is coming this way. Anyway, and he was coming this way. Ubejan came along. Out of the setting sun, he came. Ubejan, Ubejan, Ubejan. 
he squashed the mound. Now, Maurice and Albert were lucky to, rem you know, remain unscathed by all this. Like I say, entitled millennial types, though they were, they were very intelligent, and they disappeared off as he stepped on the mound, and they were safe. Not so many of their colleagues, who unfortunately departed this life uh, post-haste. The building committee met again the next morning and decided that they would build again, but in the same place. Now, to Maurice and Albert, quite intelligent, entitled millennial types, this seemed an absolutely ridiculous option. Clearly, this rhino used this path often. Their objections went unheard because they'd whined basically since birth, and so nobody listened to them. And they thought, to hell with this. In fact, to hell with a lot of things because we have no status in this mound and we're going to prove to these people that we are worth something and that even though we are hipsters we hipsters have worth in the termite colony and indeed to the world and we are going to show them this time and they did not build the mound that day they, all for the next three days, they plotted in secret on a fallen marula tree where a few of the workers were collecting supplies for the rest of the mound. They pretended to help, but in secret they plotted for the demise of Upejan. And on the evening of the fourth day, as the sun was setting in the great western horizon, doof, doof, blazing like a black silhouette, out of the sunset came Upejan, 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 Upejan. And he squashed the mound again. <sniffs> Didn't notice and carried on. Well, unfortunately for him, Albert and Maurice were hiding behind a very large marula tree. And as Upejan went past, they gave chase. And now you must understand, for a termite to keep up, with a black rhino is no mean feat. Obviously a black rhino is much faster than a termite. And they were going at a great speed behind Ubejan. Ubejan, Ubejan. And the two little termites going <laughs> behind him. And they chased him down the rhino path. And they could see where he was going because the rhino path curved to the side. They took a shortcut across an ant path at great risk to themselves. <laughs> And Ubejan was running on his path. And as he came round the corner, they cut him, they cut him off. And they leapt onto his tail. And now they were moving along with him. You can imagine a termite holding onto the tail of a rhino. It must have been a tremendously horrible ride. Anyway, that's what they were doing. And I'm afraid that we're going to lose signal soon, so you might have to episode two on our way back. Anyway, then what happened was Maurice, who was slightly more intelligent than Albert and was not wearing his skinny jeans like Albert was, because of course a hipster's clothing is generally completely imp impractical. But Maurice had sawn off his skinny jeans and he was he was holding on and, and was just a bit more lithe as he hung there. And Albert said to him, no, Albert, sorry, Albert was the brain, he was the sort of, he was the more physically, uh, <laughs> Maurice was more physically useful than Albert. And that is where we are going to leave the story until I'm out of Cheetah Plains. Now, I'm not sure I can finish the story in 10 minutes, but I'm going to do it my best, give it my best shot. Here was episode two. When last we left Albert and Maurice, Maurice they were hanging on Ubejan's tail. And as I said, Albert was dressed in skinny jeans and his physical number was up, so it was all he could do to hold on like that. Maurice was a bit bigger and fitter, and he said to Albert, what was I do now? What was I do now? And Albert said to him, climb up to its backside. So, duly, Maurice scrabbled his way up the tail of the rhino and he found himself eventually on the final vertebra where there was a single hair on which he held on. So now, instead of sort of shaking from side to side like his mate Albert was doing, he was just sort of bumping up and down like this. 
they look down underneath as Ube John ran. Ube John, Ube John. He's, oh, I'm on his backside. What was I doing now, Albert? What was I doing now? And Albert, who let go with one of his six feet to cup his little leg to his mouth, said, Climb onto it along its back and get onto its shoulder. As he duly did, but it took a long time. And Uber John, of course, at this stage was completely oblivious that he had two passengers that he did not know about. And so, painful step by painful step, never letting go with more than one foot at a time, Maurice crept his way along the back of Uber John. It was a dreadfully tough time for him. His very fashionable hipster clothes, unfortunately, were becoming torn, but on the back of the animal, Albert held on manfully. Now, apparently we're going to finish the story while we look at the horizon. Now, what then happened, of course, was that eventually Maurice made it to the shoulder. Now, you, you know how a shoulder moves on an animal. It kind of goes from side to side like this. So he found a hair on which to hold there and found himself going around like this, a bit like a sort of a piston on a, on, a, on a steam train. And Albert's still holding on the back. And Uwe Jan's still going, Uwe Jan, Uwe Jan, Uwe Jan. Anyway, Maurice holding on for dear life to the one hair that he could find on the shoulder of the black rhinoceros Ubejan and sitting next to the tick, a tick that was encased in mud, breathing its last. He ignored the tick and he shouted back to Albert. He said, I'm on a shoulder now. I'm on a bleeding shoulder. What was I doing now? And Albert shouted back up. He couldn't see his friend anymore, but he shouted back up. He said, get on to his neck. Please get onto his neck, it's the only thing for it. So he climbed manfully onto the neck, or termitefully, onto the neck of Ubejan, the great black rhino. Ubejan, Ubejan. And there he found one last hair, and he hung on for grim life. By this stage, Albert was spent, and he dropped onto the ground behind Ubejan, but Ubejan just kept going. And as he disappeared, Maurice looked behind him and saw his friend on the path behind and shouted, what was I do now? What was I do now, Albert? And Albert said, you've got to do one more thing, Maurice. Strangle the bastard. And that's the end of the story. <laughs>